Okay, this is our fourth and hopefully our final section for this chapter. Uh, chapter four on um, the role of government. And here uh, we talk about liability. So government provides the judicial system that creates, interprets, and enforces the law. So government plays a role um, in, in the judicial system. There are um, state courts, there are federal courts, and there are maybe even county, county stipulations, but we're talking about mostly federal and state. Now, there, now the state, the uh, judicial system, um, uh, is pretty much an open access system, and um, this is uh, led to environmental clean, uh, cleanup. Now, the Superfund sites and such was um, was individuals suing companies or government suing companies, and so so that's a good thing. But it has also led to uh, massive torts, and torts being massive um, liability damages. Now the downside risk is that excessive litigation can be harmful to um, uh, to innovation. As your book states, uh, litigation is intended to inhibit behavior that unduly harms humans and the environment. That's good. A downside risk is that excessive litigation will inhibit innovation. So developers, and this is the this is the interesting part, that developers of new products and processes including medicinal cures and alternative energies, may not want to bear the risk of costly lawsuits in order to introduce new products with uncertain dangers and rewards. And there is a, a, a very interesting example that your author gives here. Uh, if, a, if a firm is pondering a, a project, and even if, there, if you look at the expected cost and benefit, even if there is a one in 10,000 chance of having a big, um, uh, a big case against them, uh, a big damage reward, that may, that may increase the expected costs that, um, that would be greater than the expected benefit and the firm and or person would not do the innovative activity. So there is certainly that downside risk. Okay, now a little bit more on expected value calculations. I just talked about the expected cost and benefit calculation. And that really, uh, remember that expected costs and benefits depend upon the individual's um, sense of the damages and especially the individual's sense of the probabilities for those, for those damages. Okay, your book talks about um, being risk neutral, a firm is risk neutral if it cares only about the expected value of the cost and not about the range of possible costs. And a firm is risk averse if the mere uncertainty of damage dissuades them from um, from doing the activity. Um, you know, many many people when they engage in risk activities may indeed be risk averse. Um, now, of course, I guess you could be risk um, you could be risk loving and and say the hell with the with those risk calculations. But many of us are indeed risk averse. <clears throat> now, insurance has a role with regard to risk averseness. Um, and to um, to quote your author, if you think about it, it's clear that companies selling all types of insurance, fire, theft, health, and other types can earn profits only because risk-averse consumers are willing to pay more than the expected cost in order to, in order to avoid uncertainty. So insurance really, go, really tries to sell those folks who don't want any risk whatsoever and have the insurance company bur bear the burden of that risk. Um, that's all well and good, but you know, try to then collect from the insurance company if you indeed you file a claim. They're going to make it kind of difficult for you to do that. <clears throat> now, how might a firm um, be persuaded to engage or not engage in an activity that might have environmental consequences? Um, 
um, uh, unfortunately, if uh, if there are high um, litigation damages, um, they that firm may be um, may be persuaded to not engage in um, in that activity. Let's see what your book has to say. Um, yeah, for those firms whose level of precaution would be appropriate without the without the added incentives that litigation provide. The threat of litigation causes excessive uh, levels of, pre of precaution. So, um, <clears throat> you know, litigation, if it's done right, can persuade a firm not to engage in, in an activity. Um, <clears throat> but if it's if it's excessive, um, then the, um, then the firm may be maybe just too cautious and too cautious indeed. Okay. So government has other tools that your that your book talks about. One being regulation, and just strictly to um, regulate human activity so as to not have harmful environmental consequences. Um, one example of that would be um, uh, would be for overpopulation. That would be um, China's one child pro uh, policy um, that China experimented with in the um, uh, in the I think it was the 1970s but then but then has definitely relaxed that um, because it violated human uh, human rights <clears throat> let's see um, so they um, your book says regulations could set standards for environmental safety that are ex exculpatory, meaning that those who comply with the, with the designated level of safety testing or those who maintain their emissions below a particular level could not be subsequently held for those, um, for those actions. So, you know, if, if you obey the speed limit, um, you will not be held liable for the actions of, um, of others, at least, in, at least in a court case. So that's regulation. Uh, education and moral leadership. If the leaders engage in activities that are that are beneficial to the environment, that may um, that that may lead others to who are following um, to do much the same thing. So your book has examples of Michelle Obama planting gardens at, at the at the White House. Um, a leader implores every citizen to actively promote sustainable development, as in Singapore, um, and other examples as well. And there, and there could be education through the public schools, and mostly the government is involved in that. And that could, that could also, through educational programs, we have lots of examples of that here at Woodbury Community College, to increase environmental awareness and environmental education. And finally, the, and the government can engage in dispute resolution um, so as to um, um, mitigate the um, problems that may occur with, um, with disputes. But to do that, you have to have a fairly stalwart government. And that can break down if you have international conflicts. And that's why we have organizations um, like the United Nations to hopefully resolve international conflicts um, but those can get tricky because now you don't have government as the bulwark. You have one government in a dispute with another government. Okay, and this is an example of, um, of regulation. Um, let's see what your book has here. There it is. Um, this is a government, I think it's in Alabama and Florida regulating fishing to avoid the tragedy of the commons. Okay, last slide here. Um, the EPA and environmental regulation. The EPA, otherwise known as the Environmental Protection Agency, is the backbone of U.S. government efforts to protect the environment. And they are the enforcement arm and they, um, they actually got started um, amazingly, 
um, during the times of uh, Richard Nixon in 1970. And this came about um, through Rachel Carson's book, uh, Silent Spring. So it was an intense interest in the environment, not so much with global warming that we've got now, but in the 1970s, uh, Earth Day actually got started in the 1970s. So, and there are several U.S. environmental laws that your book, um, your book mentions, um, the Freedom of Information Act, Occupational Health and Safety Act passed in 1970, the Clean Air Act passed in 1970s, Endangered Species Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, yeah, a lot of these were passed in the 1970s, Clean Water Act. Um, and depending upon the, um, the, the administration, these laws are either strengthened and or weakened. Now there is a number of U.S. cabinet departments that also interpret and enforce the law. That would be the Department of Energy, Department of the Interior, Interior Department of Agriculture, Health and Human Services, and the Department of Commerce. So these, um, these agencies help to interpret and enforce the law. But then, as I previously said, the passion and enforcement of intensity varies with the political climate, especially in the White House. And um, you know, we we went through quite a um, quite a storm storm change from Obama. Now that we have now we have President Trump, in um, in the office, and very very big difference in the uh, enforcement of environmental protection between that administration and President Trump. Okay, this ends chapter four, the role of government.